Father, we thank you once more that we're able to meet together. We pray that your spirit will speak to us and we will be able to hear. We have so many things to get out of the way. We pray that we'll be willing to let go of our own strange ideas to hear your voice. Bless us as we hear your real plan. May we follow it and encourage someone else in Jesus' precious name. Last time we made an allusion, an allusion to a quote, not one in 20. Well, this week we're going to uh, give you another quote, a, a different one. And she uh, ups the numbers on us. The number is one in 100. <laughs> yeah. It didn't get better, it got worse. And that was in her lifetime. She says, I'm going to have to read it to you. I'll give you two places that you can look up and study it. The first quote is One Selected Messages 369. That's where everybody goes when they want to know about it, not one in 100. Because that's about the only place you can find it, except for the original place. And the original place is Review and Herald. September 3rd, 1889. And whenever I can find a quote, I don't mess around with the, with the compilations anymore. I go right to the original quote to see what she's really saying. It's very helpful to see what she's talking about. So I propose that today, instead of reading you what you can find in the compilation, that we just see what she was talking about. We're going to go to the Review and Herald. I'm sorry. What did I give you? Review and Herald, September 3rd, 1889? Is that what I gave you? Okay. Now that's kind of an interesting date, isn't it? 1889. What has just happened? 1888. So it's got something to do with 1888. Now that should make our ears go way up and say, oh, this statement means more to me already. Well, in 1889, she was on her way to Rome, New York. Now, if you don't know what happened in 1889, then it's not going to say a whole bunch to you, Rome, New York. But in 1889 was the worst catastrophe this country had ever faced, natural catastrophe. It was the Johnstown Flood. Now, you don't know what the Johnstown Flood is, so that doesn't mean anything to you either. <laughs> there, was, there was a private club 14 miles out of town. And they had a big dam and a whole bunch of water, 20 million gallons worth of water. And the dam broke. Now, this town is 14 miles away. What do they care? Well, they should have cared. Because that water came out of that broken dam at 40 miles an hour, a wall 40 feet high, and went right through that town and absolutely destroyed it. There was nothing left. You could see all the pieces of houses and wood and buildings laying up against a, a, a rock bridge. That's all that was left of the town. Nothing. Just shreds everywhere. 2,209 people died, and that's the whole, the whole town. And right afterward, while all this was still sitting there, Ellen White drives through town on a train on her way to Rome. And she's looking at all of this. So that's what's going on here. She's now starting to write, and she preached. And this really made an impression on her. This is the biggest thing she ever saw in real life. Destruction, death. So let's start reading. You might look it up, by the way. They've got lots of pictures of this on the web if you want to read it, read it and see it. It's very impressive what happened there. Those poor people never knew it was coming. It says, we left Williamsport... Pennsylvania, June 12th, 
for Rome, New York. We were glad to leave the flooded district. As I looked at the ruins from the from the windows, the car windows, and as I read the harrowing details of the destruction of human life at Johnstown, I could but think of the greater disaster. Excuse me, greatest part of my page is missing here. Part of the, the the greatest disasters that are yet to come upon the world. See, she's always thinking about what's coming, what's happening, what it means to the plan of salvation. Always, she sees this flood, the devastation, the damage. First, she thinks she's thinking about what does this mean for eternity. As the restraining power of the Holy Spirit shall be withdrawn because of the impenitence and gratitude of men, terrible things will be witnessed in the earth. Yeah. Yeah. Johnstown's going to be nothing when the real thing comes. So she begins talking about these things. I'm not going to read this to you. You can read the whole thing. I just want to see some context. It says, God has manifested unparalleled love in giving his beloved son to die for fallen man. Who did he give? Does he have one? In giving his beloved son to do what? Who's his beloved son? He's the divine son of God. He is divine and she just said he could, he's going to die. Didn't she say divinity cannot die? Well, she must have meant something we're not getting because she just said here he's going to die. It says, the unparalleled love in giving his beloved son to die for the fallen man. Now, we should just get that in our heads. Jesus, before he became a man, was slated by God to die as that person he was before he was a man. Okay, let's continue here. It says, But men have not appreciated this love and have refused the gift of salvation. Refused. That doesn't mean that they didn't know it. It means they refused. Period. Refused. As I looked upon the destruction around me, I determined... To be more earnest in warning the people. <laughs> this is Ellen White. <laughs> she saw that mess up there. She saw that death. I'm going to be more earnest now. Have those who have had great light and great privileges made corresponding improvement? Have they become pure, faithful, and humble before God? Okay, I'm moving on here. She said, uh, we were heartily welcomed by our friends in New York and we're soon comfortably situated in a tent prepared for us. She, she's comfortable in a tent now. Is that us? We're going to settle down comfortably in a tent? It says, uh, I felt worn and exhausted by it. Esteemed it a privilege to speak to the people or the sample. I was compelled to use crutches because I turned my ankle again. She said, I was, I was lame. And we don't get the picture of her. She's doing this all the time. She's always in trouble, physically. She's always getting messed up somehow. She's not having a stroke. She's got some, some other terrible thing hitting her. Continuing. So now she's on crutches because of her ankle. She turned it again. And she, has, she puts that word again in there. So this is a thing that just is going on all the time. The pain was so severe, my heart was affected. So now she's got heart problems. And I was not even yet fully recovered from the shock. I was unable to attend the Sabbath services. But she said they had a good meeting. The Spirit of the Lord was moving. The Spirit. Of, what does she mean, the Spirit of the Lord? Does she mean a third deity? Doesn't sound like it, doesn't it? The Spirit of the Lord on Sunday afternoon. I was there. So now she's a little bit better. It says, uh, man will have something with which to occupy his thoughts. The soul cannot be empty. We either love God or serve mammon. So we have a choice. 
The soul cannot be empty. It's going to be full of something. It's either going to love God or it's going to love mammon. There's no other place to go. Weirdly enough, many people think there's a place called neutrality. They'll wait and make a decision sometime. No, they've already decided. If God isn't there, the devil is. That's that simple. As I spoke to the people, the Lord raised me above my infirmities. Here we go again. This always happens with her. She stands up. She's, she's falling down. She can't get out of her bed. She tells us, lift me up. Hold me up while I'm talking to the people. The Lord always heals her right there on the spot. He, he does something to make her better. She, here she goes again. As I spoke to the people, the Lord raised me up above my infirmities. In my intense interest for souls, I forgot I was lame. The Lord would have his church arise and shine. Of course, that's Isaiah. She's always talking Bible, and you have to know the Bible to know what she's doing. Arise and shine. For the brightness of the light of God has shone upon his people in the message of present truth. What is present truth? Don't answer. I'm going to ask, have her answer it for us. It's not what everybody thinks today. Present truth. True. If we all heed the precious words given them from the great teacher, how many is that? Who is that? It's not what everybody calls the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus himself. There's only one great teacher. She's always saying things that are anti-Trinitarian if we're just paying attention. There's no way you can make her a Trinitarian if you're paying attention to what, what she is writing and saying to us. There are good things in store for those who love God. And all who fervently desire his blessing will receive light and truth as meet in due season. She then says, I feel anxious the light of heaven might shine upon the people of God in this conference. And then she quotes Jesus the words that I speak, they are spirit. There's the spirit. There's the spirit. They're the words of Jesus. Jesus is himself, but his words are his spirit. Do you get it? His words are present where he isn't physically. Do you see it? There's a message here. All right. It says, those who profess the name of Christ must live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's the part of the scripture that's out of, it's gone out of the new versions. That's the part she puts in. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I'm skipping whole paragraphs here. I just want, to, want you to feel what she's doing here when she gets to our little sentence. The feeling of many hearts might be expressed in the words of the Apostle. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is that the way you feel? Oh, blessed be the Father. God. God is the Father. God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Two different people. It's not one person with another one making a trinity. It's not there. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the spirit of prophecy. I hope when you read, this stuff is bouncing out at you all the time. So it becomes absolute second nature so that when you talk to somebody, you're surprised when they don't see what it's saying. You should be really surprised. <laughs> okay, continuing. Which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection. Now is your brain screaming at you something? The resurrection of Jesus? Who needs to be resurrected? Dead people. Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus said it. The Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, the divine Son of God, had to be resurrected. You only resurrect dead people. That is so simple. 
Why don't we say it to somebody? <laughs> Resurrection. From death. The Son of God died. Just like she said a little further up there. All right, let me read it again. Begone us again into lively hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. She says it. From the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that faded not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. Oh, we, we are kept by the power of God. The present message. Now, I said I was going to read that to you. Here it comes. Are you listening? The present message. Justification by faith. Is a message from God. End of quote. Now, did she say the present message. Righteousness by faith. Did she say that? She didn't say, did she? She never says it. You can read every 25 million word bunch of it. She never says the Seventh-day Adventist message is righteousness by faith. Never! She continually is saying all through her life, through her writings, justification by faith. Now, is there a difference? Well, you better figure out what the difference is between justification and sanctification, which is righteousness by faith would only fit at, at sanctification. Our message is justification by faith because it's the part we can't do. Do you see it? There is no way we can justify ourselves. It's absolutely impossible. It has to be a free gift. And that's our message to the world. The free gift of God in Jesus Christ of forgiveness, pardon, and a new life. Free! You can't earn it. That's our message. And we are applying it. Because we're saying instead of that, just believe. Well, you're putting it back on me. If I believe, then I'm saved. If I don't believe, then I'm not saved. What's that got to do with Jesus? It's all about me, my faith. That is pure legalism. And I'm not going to get into this subject today. I have a lot to say about this false doctrine, righteousness by faith, that our church has swallowed hook, line, and sinker and says it the same way the Sunday keepers do. And if people want to challenge me on that, I'm happy to hear from them. Yes, because there is a lot of Bible and spirit prophecy on what the real message of Seventh-day Adventists is. It's justification by faith in the surety. I'm going to spend some time with that before we're done here. Not today, but as we go along here, because we are studying the Incarnation for a reason. Jesus did not live his life merely by faith. He lived righteousness, period, by the power of the Father in that humanity. Righteousness. Continuing. The present message, justification by faith, is a message from God. It bears the divine credentials for its fruit is unto holiness. Now, do you remember when we talked about spiritualism? That is what spiritualism hates, is holiness. That's what Socrates, Plato, all the rest of them, origin, they all went over towards faith without holiness. There's no such thing as a real Seventh-day Adventist who has faith without holiness. It's not possible. Because that's our message. She just said it here. Justification by faith. Present message. Its fruit is holiness. It's not doctrine. It's not theology. It's holiness. Some who greatly need the precious truth that was presented before them, we fear, did not receive its benefit. They did not open the door to their hearts to welcome Jesus. Where is that in the Bible? Open the door. Revelation, 
Yeah, open the door. I will come in. Who comes in? Jesus. Jesus. Does it say anything about a third divinity coming in? Not a word. It's always Jesus himself. These are familiar scriptures to all Seventh-day Adventists. We ought to remind them what they really say, those scriptures. Welcome, Jesus, as a heavenly guest. They have suffered several, uh, great loss. So we must learn to live by faith. Now, here's the way the righteousness by faith people say it. We must learn to live by faith. They're putting it at the wrong place. Faith is not the issue. It's living. If you have the kind of faith that God gives, then you will live that life. No, people don't want to know what they're living. They want to know what their faith is. That's backwards. Okay, I'm going to try start saying more and more about this to show why it is Instead of finding it something we want to do, what God says, to live that way, we say, oh, I better have more faith because I'm not doing it. I just better believe more. Well, I have to tell you, your belief isn't going to change anything. You're going to continue to live the way you're living because your faith is never going to get in better than what you have right now. <laughs> yeah, if you're counting on your faith, it's going to let you down. What you have to have is trust in Jesus Christ that he will not only deliver you, but he will keep you. Continuing. We are not safe if we neglect to search the scriptures. Should, did she say search the scriptures? That's another one. You can look everywhere in her writings, including the 40 times that she quotes John about search the scriptures. And every time she says search. In all the modern versions, it says, you search already. See? No, you're going to find out reading the Spirit Prophecy correctly will help you understand the Bible correctly, and you will see that the King James is correct, and the modern versions are corrupt. Continuing, she's saying lots of things we can get a hold of all the way across the board. It must be entertained in the mind, welcomed in the heart, and be cherished, loved, and obeyed. We need also much more knowledge. What is that? Knowledge. Is that John 17, 3? She says, she's hitting them all. She's going through here. All right. Now let me read you what she says after she just said, We need much more knowledge. We need to be enlightened in regard to to the plan of salvation. We don't know the plan of salvation. We're all Seventh-day Adventists. We need to be enlightened in regard to the plan of salvation. There is not one in a hundred. Oh, now here it comes. Here's the context we know now. There is not one in a hundred who understands for himself the Bible truth on this subject that is so necessary for our present and eternal welfare. What did you just say? There's not a one in a hundred Seventh-day Adventists. Not one? One? How many is one? <laughs> one in a hundred who understands the plan of salvation. So the next time you go into a 200-member church, look around and then remind yourself how many people in those 200 Seventh-day Adventists at that church on that day understand the plan of salvation. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Going into church after church after church and looking around and saying, man, look at all these people. Let me see if I can find somebody that understands the plan of salvation. Are you beginning to see why it is so difficult to talk to people about spiritual things that the Bible teaches that their church doesn't teach? Because there's not one in a hundred that understands the plan of salvation. Now, that's a simple little statement. I think she only wrote it one time. 
But that little statement absolutely blows away a lot of things. That's a heavy, heavy statement. If you have a thousand member church, now that's a big deal. They have socials and potlucks and everything every week. How many understand the plan of salvation in a thousand people? How can that be that in the Seventh-day Adventist Church only a handful of people, literally a handful, ten in a thousand, <laughs> even understands the plan of salvation? So do you think I have been kidding all these weeks in these meetings talking about the Incarnation? The mystery? There's no mystery to the people who are being talked to by God about Jesus being the divine Son of God and becoming a man. There's no mystery to that. Now the how, yes, we're never going to understand that. There are lots of things that are mysterious about it, but the fact is not a mystery to the people of God. Jesus had two natures and became the man Jesus. That's it. We can all get that. We'll study that for all eternity, how he could have done that. But the fact is, we know he did it. So the incarnation is important. We need to know it, and we're studying it right now. We're not done. We're never going to finish. But we need to see how it fits with other areas. Right now, we're trying to see that without the incarnation, there is no plan of salvation. There is no plan of salvation. It's a God. And without the Son of God in heaven, before he became a man, there is no incarnation. If you don't have a Son of God in heaven before creation, you don't have an incarnation. You don't have a plan of salvation. The Trinity people have destroyed the plan of salvation. And the reason they don't know it is because not one in a hundred understands the plan of salvation among Seventh-day Adventists. Are you getting this? She's telling us the whole thing. It's the trouble. It's the reason we have the troubles we have today in our church. We've got a bunch of people who do not understand the plan of salvation. And we're going to be talking about it carefully here now. Now, I don't like just talking about doctrines. I like to know why. I like to know all the little things that hook up together and makes one big ball of truth. And if you can tear that little ball of truth out of there and all of a sudden it's not one complete thing anymore, you don't have truth anymore. When I first became a Seventh-day Adventist, the reason, one of the reasons it really appealed to me was I couldn't find a hole in it. Everywhere I look, things fit, including the 2300 days, yes, including the state of the dead, yes, including the Sabbath, yes, everything fit. But you know, there was one trick the devil played on me I didn't count on, and the Lord permitted it for a reason. It never even dawned on me to figure out who the Holy Spirit is. <laughs> Never dawned on me there was a problem. There's the Father, I can see him. There's the Son, I can see him. Spirit, I can't see him. Well, I guess it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's it. I guess it doesn't matter. So I kind of let it go, but it didn't stay down because I discovered later in my experience that there were no holes in all the things I could see in the Bible, but I couldn't see the Spirit. And that began to bother me. <laughs> And it became clear to me one day that I didn't understand it at all. And so I said, I can go two ways here. I can either say, it doesn't matter. I'll ask God when I see him in person. Or it does matter and I'm not going to be in heaven. Because I don't understand this. <laughs> I have no, no way of knowing anything about this. It makes no sense to me. So I just kind of went along like that, went along like that. I said, how can the whole Seventh-day Adventist Church be wrong on this 
and have nothing to say. How is that possible? But you know, the Lord finally got through to me and said, it's not only possible, but we have a real problem here. You better look at this. I said, Lord, you've got me in a place I don't, I don't like. I don't like it. I see a hole now, and I don't want to see a hole. I joined this church because there were no holes. I'm, I'm seeing a hole. Now, I don't know if it's my problem or if it's the church's problem at this point, but I know there's a hole. So I'm going to ask you something, Lord. When we finally have our interview face to face someday, and you tell me I can't go into heaven because I didn't believe in the Holy Spirit, I'm going to tell you something on that day that I hope I never have to say. Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> I don't know because I have nothing to work with. Why didn't you tell me? That's what I have to say to you. Now, please, don't let me get up to that place to say that horrible thing. Show me! Show me! Well, he shut my mouth and he showed me. He showed me there's no such thing as a third deity, that Jesus is the Holy Spirit. That became so clear. It's all I can do now to keep quiet without telling somebody, no matter who it is, that Jesus is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> now, I've had to learn to back off a little bit, yes, because everybody's not ready to hear this. But I can say it now, and did you notice I don't blush when I say that? I don't stutter when I say it. I don't say, oh, excuse me, when I say that. Sorry, no, I don't say that either. It's the realest thing in the universe. Jesus is the divine Son of God. And it's worse now because now I know the whole Jewish church was lost because the leaders refused to believe Jesus was the Son of God. That means a whole church can be lost over it. That means a whole world can be lost. On it. And I'm going to have some meetings on that someday soon also. There are so many quotations in Spirit of Prophecy. She says, those people, the whole nation went down because of the leaders. A whole nation was lost because they refused to believe Jesus is the Son of God. Well, we're seeing the context now. Don't you think context is important when Ellen White says not one in a hundred understands? She's been saying a lot here. She includes the Son of God right at the top there. The Father and the Son of God. She says if we come to the Word of God with a teachable, humble spirit, Teachable, that's first. You know what a person is that has a creed? Unteachable, it's impossible. You cannot teach a person who believes in a creed anything that's not in that creed. You can't do it. They have an unteachable spirit just because they have the creed. So she says when you come to God with a teachable, humble spirit, the rubbish of error will be swept away. And the gems of truth long hidden from our eyes will be discovered. What are those gems of truth that have been hidden from our eyes? Well, what people call them before they're swept away, they call them mysteries. And that's what they are. They're mysteries. That's the next thing I'm going to look at with you here while the time lasts. What a mystery is and what she includes in the mystery that has to be swept away. She says there's a great need that Christ should be preached as the only hope of salvation. Now, doesn't that word mean you can throw everything else away except Jesus? Only Jesus. He's all that's necessary in the plan of salvation. Jesus. I don't need another God. I don't need another deity. I don't need something the world calls the Holy Spirit besides Jesus. No, the Holy Spirit is Jesus. 
I only need Jesus. Okay, continuing. She says, when the doctrine of justification by faith was presented at the Rome meeting, it came to many as water comes to a thirsty traveler. What did she present? And what did Jones and Wagner present? What is the third angel's message? Justification by faith. She never says righteousness by faith. We have sold out to the Sunday keepers with that little phrase. There is such a thing as righteousness which is of faith. But that righteousness which is of faith is the righteousness of Christ. The Lord, our righteousness. But righteousness by faith, as the Sunday keepers teach it, is just believe. That's from the devil. Just believe. Well, we're getting into the subject a little early because I plan to lean into it a little bit the more we get into this. We have no idea what's made us go off the path so, so far. It's because we're holding on to sacred cows. Do you know what a sacred cow is? Have you ever seen pictures of India in the streets? The people are walking around and you see these horns in the middle of them. <laughs> yeah, it's not the devil, it's cows. Their cows are everywhere because they can't touch the cows. They can't hurt the cows. Those cows are sacred. <laughs> They're holy cows, sacred cows. We have sacred cows in the Adventist church. Did you know that? Yes, we have a bunch of them. We've got to get rid of those sacred cows and become Christians. Continuing here, when the doctrine of justification by faith was presented at the Rome meeting, it came to many as water comes to the thirsty child. The thought, here we go, here we go. She's going to say it. She sneaks by it and it goes by it. The righteousness by faith, people never see it. Here it comes. The thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. Not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God. Seemed a precious thought. There it is. There's the seventh Adventist message. The righteousness of Christ, not my faith. My faith earns nothing. Desire of Ages, page 174. <laughs> I didn't make the sentence up. It's on that page. Our faith earns nothing. So if you're trying to get into heaven by your faith, you're never going to make it. I'm sorry. The righteousness of Christ as a free gift to us. That's salvation. That's the plan of salvation. It doesn't sound like a plan, does it? sounds like one thing. Well, we're going to get into the plan here before we're done. We have to understand the plan of salvation. Many are in a lukewarm condition because they do not live by faith. She did not say because they don't live by faith. She didn't say that. It's because they don't live by faith. And that's what Paul said when he was quoting Habakkuk, the righteous shall live by their faith. Live! If you're not living it, what difference does it make what you think you believe? Live it! And that's what Habakkuk was saying. So Luther was quoting Habakkuk correctly and Paul was. I think we ought to start quoting them correctly. That my interest is living the righteousness of Christ because he has imputed it to me as a gift. That's my hope. Galatians 5.5 5. We have the hope of righteousness by faith. That's not the way ministers read it today. They say we have the hope of righteousness by faith. It's wrong. Same words, but it's all wrong. Continuing. Such have need to be greatly alarmed lest that which the Lord placed within their reach at infinite cost should be taken away and given to others who will prize the gift and use it 
to his glory, for his glory. Infinite? Did it say infinite cost? Can a human do that? I guess the human didn't do that. The human did not give infinite value. The human gave everything he had, yes. And that was plenty. <laughs> but it was infinity that paid the price. The Son, the infinite Son of God in that human form. Our only safety is in continually looking to Jesus. It is perilous to the soul to hesitate, to question, and to criticize divine light. Perilous to the soul. When the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It's true peril for anybody to say, well, it doesn't mean that. It means a metaphor. By the way, in the, the new Adventist world, Rodriguez does it again. He's got another article on metaphor. Yeah, these people are not letting go. They're going to be sure the Adventist people believe the leaders instead of the Word of God. Every ray of light that heaven sends is essential for our salvation. Every ray. Unless... Divine power is brought into the experience of the people of God. False theories and erroneous ideas will take minds captive. Well, now you know what's happening. She just told us what's happening. If the divine power is not brought to the person who says they're a Christian, then a theory is going to take it. Yeah, an erroneous idea. Says the people have not an intelligent faith. They have not been instructed as they should have been that Christ is unto them both salvation and righteousness. The love that Christ manifested in taking human nature. Is that the incarnation? There it is. The love that Christ manifested in taking human nature, in bearing insult, reproach, and the rejection of men, in suffering crucifixion on the cross, should be presented in every discourse. That's real preaching. That's Bible preaching. That's godly preaching. Not travel logs. Not psychological treatises. Not little stories. It's Jesus, the divine Son of God, becoming a man and taking it all for us and then being crucified. That should be talked about every time. Every time. If Satan... Can succeed men in uh, leading man to place value upon his own works as works of merit and righteousness. He knows he can overcome him. You know another way to say that? If Satan can get us looking at ourselves to see how we're doing, he's got us. See? He's got us because he knows we're not doing very well. He knows it and he knows we know it. And he has to get us to concentrate on what we're doing to see if we have enough faith. Because I'm going to get saved by my faith. Forget it, folks. Your faith is never going to save you. Faith is important. Nothing happens without faith. But it's got to be the right kind of faith. The faith in Jesus himself, not in my own faith. All right. Let's, uh, let's try something else. I want to now go to Signs of the Times. Let's see if I can get back there. Here we go. I got it. I punched the right button. <laughs> Signs of the Times, March 25th, 1897. I want to talk to you about a mystery now. The way God talks about it. 
the way the spirit prophecy talks about it. There's the way the article begins. Quote, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Now that is so loaded. We could spend a couple of weeks with that sense, but that's just the way she introduces her subject. Paul says that God raised him up so they could see the mystery. Well, if mysteries can't be known, what is that? <laughs> Paul is saying, God raised me up so you can see the mystery. Which he hid. He hid it before. But God didn't actually do the hiding. It's because we didn't want to know. That's the problem. That's another subject here. It says, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So who did God create things by? Was it the Holy Spirit? That's what we teach in the church today. That's, as a matter of fact, in our formal beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church today, that the Holy Spirit and the Father and Jesus all created. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Spirit of Prophecy says. As a matter of fact, it's impossible because there is no such thing as a third deity. We teach the impossibility as a Seventh-day Adventist Church. Isn't that interesting? All right, so it says, Who created all things by Jesus Christ? So it says, so that all this could be known by the church. What do they know? The wisdom of God in the way he does things. The plan of salvation, see? So we can know his wisdom in the way he's doing things. Then, he, then she quotes another one. That one was Ephesians that she quotes from Colossians. She says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery. So what's he here for? To fulfill the mystery, to let you see, to make it known, to fulfill it to you, which had been hid from ages and generations, but now it's made manifest to the saints to the people of God. They can see the mystery. They understand it. They know it. The hope of glory, which we preach to every man, teaching every man his wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving and work, according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. So that's his job, to make the mystery known to God's people. So she begins her article now by saying, what is this mystery? <laughs> now that's what we want to know. What is this mystery of which Paul writes to the Ephesians and the Colossians saying that it was given him to fulfill the word of God, the mystery of which had been hidden from ages and generations. She says many have endeavored to define the mystery. All right, I'm going to skip down now to the next paragraph. God had a knowledge of the events of the future even before the creation of the world. Do you know we have books at the ABC right now that say God doesn't know everything? He can't read the future? Yeah, you can go buy it at the ABC. She just said God has a knowledge of everything in the future. And of course we all knew that. Anyhow, we didn't need a theologian to tell us somehow. It says... He did not make his purposes to fit circumstances. But he allowed matters to develop and work out. He did not work to bring about a certain condition of things, but he knew that such a condition would exist. The plan. Oh, there's the word. That's our meeting today. It took me this long to get there. <laughs> You're used to that, though. <laughs> the plan. That should be carried out upon the defection of any of the high intelligence of heaven. This is the secret, the mystery, which has been hid from ages. What is it? 
What's what's the mystery? What's the secret of the ages that was hidden from everybody? The plan. What's the plan? Jesus. Jesus would pay the price. That's the mystery. How would he pay the price? It depends on who fell. See? Depends on who fell. It was Adam that fell. So the only way Jesus could pay the price was to take Adam's place, become a man. There's the incarnation. The incarnation is the mystery. But when people say the incarnation is a mystery, they think the incarnation is something you can never know. No, no, no. That's not what the Bible means. That's not what the spirit prophecy means. The incarnation is a mystery means that's what nobody knew until man fell. And then when he fell, Jesus stepped forth and said, here, we can do the plan now. We have the plan. <laughs> do you still think Ellen White was wrong saying people don't understand the plan of salvation? Well, we can just see in a couple sentences here. Who knows this? Just what we've read so far. The mystery is the plan of God to solve the problem of somebody falling. The plan that should be carried out upon the defection of any of the high intelligence of heaven. And an offering was prepared in the eternal purposes to do the very work which God has done for fallen humanity. So, since man fell, the plan comes into effect now. There's the plan. Long before creation even happened. Before anything happened. When God the Father and Jesus were alone all by themselves. And that's not an original thought to anybody because all the pioneers taught that. Haskell wrote it down in Seer of Patmos. The Father and the Son were alone before creation. Well, if the Father and the Son were alone, that means there was no third being. Isn't that simple? <laughs> of course, today they say Haskell was a nut. No, he was not a nut. That man knew the Bible, the Spirit of Prophecy, and he knew the truth. Paul was taken up to the third heaven, and there he saw and heard things which is not lawful for a man to utter, mysteries which had been hidden for ages were revealed to him. <laughs> There's the word, revealed. A mystery is something that God reveals to his people. But once it's revealed, it's not a mystery anymore. Revealed to him, and as much as he could bear of the workings of God and his dealings with human minds was made known. So what God showed him about the mystery, he showed to humans. So the church learned what the mysteries were from Paul. The Lord told Paul that he must preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now you didn't hear that the first time I said it, did you? Does anybody here remember me saying those words? I just read them. Two paragraphs up. Your brain did not register them. There's a reason. Because the unsearchable riches of Christ is the 1888 message. Yes. And I'm going to have a whole meeting to prove that. That she just told us what she thought 1888 was about. And Jones and Wagner both blew it after that because they didn't fully understand what they were even saying and they left it like they never knew about it. Yes, because they didn't understand it themselves and they were saying it. The unsearchable riches of Christ. They said the words. She's saying the words. But she's going to say it a different way. And they didn't stay up with it. They didn't follow along. I'm getting into new meetings here. I shouldn't do that. But she changes the words later. Instead of the unsearchable riches of Christ, she says, the matchless charms of Jesus. We're going to have a whole meeting on that little sentence to show that Jones and Wagner did not get that far. That's why they mess messed up the Incarnation eventually. 
That's why they messed up several things that we won't get into. We don't want to upset all the people who are still finding good things in Jones and Wagner back in the 1888 message. But they blew it, and we better realize they blew it, and they blew it for a reason. And we're looking at it right here. The unsearchable riches of Christ. The real 1888 message. Continuing. Light was to be given to the Gentiles. This is the mystery which has been hidden for ages. The great work of redemption was to be brought before all nations, kindreds, tongues, and peoples. In other words, mankind. That's what the incarnation is. Okay, mankind. Because of their disobedience, the Jews were broken off. Who are the Jews? The church. The church. God's true church was broken off of the tree. Did you think such a thing could happen? That the church could be cut off the tree? <laughs> well, you better start getting it because it already happened. The Jews as a nation, the church of God, were cut off of his tree. They were his church. And he says, I'm not going to have a church that doesn't do what I say. The Jews were broken off. And those among the Gentiles who would accept Christ as their Savior were to be grafted into the good olive tree and made one with the original branches. So true Israel is still on the planet. It may be a small group of people that Ellen White calls few. And she, de she defines who the few are. She says, there will be few who believe Jesus is the Son of God. Did you know she said that? She tells us the problem. The few! But in no case are they to boast because of this, lest they be broken off as were the natural branches. The Gentiles do nothing of conversion, excuse me, of circumcision, but they were to be brought under the covenant of grace given to Abraham. That was before the Jews and their law, wasn't it? Abraham. So Abraham had the same salvation we have. Yeah. The same salvation by grace through faith in Jesus and receiving his spirit. Abraham. Abraham is our father. The Lord talked with Paul. Now does that say... A third deity talked to Paul in, in Jesus' place. After all, Jesus was in heaven. He couldn't be here, so that the deity had to do it. No, it doesn't say that at all. It says the Lord talked with Paul and told him that the blessings given to the Jewish nation were given equally to the Gentiles. And Paul writes to them, Wherefore remember that you being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes were afar off are now made nigh. By the blood of Christ. Her next sentence is the incarnation. Do you see where she's been headed the whole time? The incarnation is a mystery. Who is it a mystery to? It's a mystery to everybody who has not had it revealed to them yet. <laughs> The Incarnation is a mystery. In this world, it's a monstrous mystery. In the church, it's a monstrous mystery. But not to the people of God. Let's see how she brings it around. The union of divinity and humanity is a mystery indeed hidden with God. In other words, how he did it. Even the mystery which has been hid from edges, it was kept in eternal silence by Jehovah and was first revealed. Now then, what happened to the mystery? <laughs> See, people want to hold on to the mystery idea, but she says it was first revealed. Does that mean it was revealed some more after that? 
<laughs> it was first revealed in Eden by the prophecy that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head, that he should bruise his heel, to present to the world this mystery that God kept in silence for eternal ages before the world was created, before man was created, was the part that Christ was to act in the work he entered upon when he came to this earth. And this wonderful mystery, the incarnation of Christ and the atonement that he made must be declared to every son and daughter of Adam, whether Jew or Gentile. This mystery must be what? Declared. You look this up in your little CD-ROM sometime. Look up the word declared the Son of God. And see how many times you find it declared. When the first disciples in the Acts of the Apostles, when they first were told to go out after Jesus went back and do their work, they set out to do their work. And what did they go out to do? To declare that Jesus was the Son of God. That's what, what their work was. To declare He was the Son of God, the Messiah. That the Jews murdered God's Son. That was their message to the Jews. But Paul was a messenger to the Gentiles. He didn't have the same message. The Gentiles didn't murder the son in the way the Jews did. So he said to the Gentiles, Jesus is the creator, the divine son of God. He had the same message, the son of God. But he added the Creator to it, to the Gentiles, because they didn't know that. But when Paul went out to preach, that's, that's what he preached. Jesus, the Son of God. When the, when the disciples went out to preach, that was their message. Jesus, the Son of God. What is the message of Christianity? What is the mystery that has to be declared to the world? Jesus is the Son of God. <laughs> Are you beginning to feel a little bit bad that you were Adventist for so long and nobody ever told you? <laughs> you might even feel worse because once you discovered it and the Lord showed it to you and you knew it was the truth and you went out to, to talk to other people about it, they didn't want to know. As a matter of fact, they, it was more than they didn't want to know. They refused to know. They don't even want to hear you. As a matter of fact, they don't even want to see you anymore. They want you gone. You're a big trouble. Do you know all of that is there with Cain and Abel? All of that. Cain and Abel. It's all over again. Two worshipers. One doing it God's way, one doing it his own way. Yeah, go look at that carefully again sometime. All these stories tell us something now. They all tell us about the Father and the Son. That's what we read before. I don't know why it says every, every lesson in the Bible reveals the Son of God and His Father. The whole Bible. Since the promise given in Eden... God has revealed his mysteries through his prophets. According to the command of the eternal God, they have been made known to all nations. So the mystery is out. <laughs> the mystery is out. God, being rich in mercy for the great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, quickens us together with Christ. So the Father raised Christ, and in the power of the resurrection, he declares him to be his son. And in that same power, he says, these are my sons and daughters also. That same resurrection. But many mysteries yet remain unrevealed. How much that is acknowledged to be a truth. 
is mysterious and unexplainable to the human mind. Do we all here know Jesus became a little baby? Yeah, we acknowledge that. We know it's a fact. God said so. Do we understand it? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> Nobody understands it. We probably never will in all eternity. It's something that's just beyond us. How God could become a baby, a human created baby. So you can know something and not be able to explain it. If it's the truth. If it's the truth. Okay. It says... We are not now sufficiently advanced in spiritual attainments to comprehend the mysteries of God. But when we shall compose the family of heaven, these mysteries will be unfolded. So then we'll see all the mysteries that creatures can understand. We'll see them. We'll understand them. Now I'm going to give you the punchline. It hits at just the right time. The punchline for today. Then much will be revealed in explanation of matters upon which God now keeps silence because we have not gathered up and appreciated that which has been made known. See? There's a lot we could know, but God's not going to tell us because we haven't used what he's already given us. God never wastes his time. He doesn't believe in throwing away time, effort, energy. He's working with his jewels. He's taking those rough rocks and he's grinding them up and he's polishing them up. And they don't like it, but he has to polish them that way. <laughs> and when he gets them all polished up, he, he has something that he knows he was going to get. But he, he doesn't do that with things that don't work. He only polishes his gems. And he's doing it. So if there are lots of things we don't understand about the Bible and don't know, don't blame God that you don't know them. Because if you use what he shows you, if you reveal to others what he shows you, because you really know it's true, and you can explain it in such a way that they can start studying, he will give you some more to work with. He will open up more mysteries to you. And he will keep doing it as long as you're keeping pace with it. But as soon as you relax and sit back and say, well, I don't want to put in the effort here. I don't want to know this. I don't need this. I, nobody will believe me if I say this. Then it cuts off. It's done. You don't get any more. Because you can't use it. It's simple. Everything is simple with God. It's too simple. The whole plan of salvation is simple. He's made it so that anybody can do it who would just do it. If we would just do it. The ways of providence will be made clear. The mysteries of grace through Christ will be unfolded. That which the mind cannot now grasp, which is hard to be understood, will be explained. We shall see order in that which has seemed unexplainable. Wisdom in everything withheld. Goodness and gracious mercy in everything imparted. Truth will be unfolded to the mind free from obscurity. Free from obscurity. You know what that tells me? No philosophy. Because that all philosophy, that's all philosophy does. It obscures everything. From origin, Clement, and all the rest of them, down to the seminaries of today. Obscurity. No, our minds will be free because Jesus will be teaching us the truth. Truth. And it all begins with one thing. Jesus is the Son of God. Yeah. Father, we're so thankful that you're breaking through. That your mysteries are speak, speaking to us because they are being revealed to us. Help us to let the barriers go down so we, we don't 
to fall into that trap of thinking there are things we just can't know that you want us to know. Help us to learn the very first lessons that Jesus came here to show us what a human being really looks like. He came to show us love and loyalty and obedience. Help us to see that he not only came to give us the example of what it looks like, but he came to give us his own life, his spirit, his power to live it the same way that he does. Help us to give up the devil's lie that no one can really obey God. That's a lie. The worst lie we perhaps will ever think about. Help us to understand. We not only can obey, we must obey by the fruits of the Spirit in Jesus' precious name. Amen.